Okay, members. Thank you. Uh, Mr. Chris Little has given notice of an urgent oral question to the Minister of Education. I would remind members that if they wish to ask a supplementary question, they should raise continually in their places. The member who tabled the question will be called automatically to ask a supplementary. Clerk, please read the question. To ask the Minister of Education for an update on the advice he has provided to schools in relation to coronavirus. And I call the Minister of Education. I look primarily the issue of the tackling coronavirus is a health issue. My department is leading on the issue of relevant and appropriate advice and guidance to schools and education partners provided by both DOH and PHA. The Department of Education is advising parents and schools to keep up to date uh, with the public health agency guidance uh, on COVID-19 and information uh, is available on the PHA website. And indeed, in terms of that advice, uh, we have also, in any contact with schools, been giving the, the links to that. If a school has any concerns in respect of either suspected or confirmed cases of uh, coronavirus, they should first, in instance, contact the NHS 111 helpline. More specifically, on the 27th of February, I personally wrote to all school principals and education sector partners, enclosing the link to the PHA website, which is updated as the situation develops and have emphasised the importance of monitoring the website regularly. I have encouraged schools to follow the guidance, in particular the need to practise uh, good hand hygiene amongst staff and pupils, and reiterated um, PHA are available to speak to individual schools, which they have offered to do, who may have specific concerns in relation to COVID-19. And indeed, I think they have also offered um, advice in terms of any levels of risk assessment. Including this uh, in this email were the updated uh, Chief Medical Officer advice and linked to the uh, Government UK latest advice and guidance, and also the opportunity to speak to the Chief Medical Officer uh, whenever uh, the first issue arose. My department continues to communicate with our education sector uh, partners, schools and education settings, using existing communication links, and has issued PHA schools advice leaflet and self-isolation advice leaflet to the education sector groups. I have also ensured that the PHA website is prominently placed on the DE website. Uh, can I say very specifically, earlier today, uh, given the change in position uh, that was uh, outlined last night by the Foreign and Commonwealth Office, my department has issued an update to all schools highlighting the change in that advice travel to areas of Northern Italy. Uh, and for those who haven't seen that advice, it is that unless there is essential travel, um, the advice from the, the Foreign and Commonwealth Office is that those areas which have been quarantined in, in Northern Italy, uh, they are not advising people to um, go to. The welfare, health and safety of pupils and staff is paramount and my uh, to myself and my departmental position, uh, officials in collaboration with the Department of Health and PHA. We continue to monitor the, what is an evolving situation and will update uh, schools and education settings, both where appropriate and as soon as, as soon as practically possible, once there is any change to the situation. And I call Chris Little to ask a supplementary question. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. And I thank the Minister for providing an update to the Assembly with regards to his advice on uh, schools uh, in relation to coronavirus containment. Does the Minister accept that there are school leaders? across Northern Ireland who feel that they have been passed from pillar to post in order to get clear guidance, particularly with regards to pupil travel to areas affected by coronavirus. And can he assure this Assembly that schools will have a direct contact with an appropriate person to seek up-to-date advice with regards to any and all pupil travel of that nature? Can he also advise the Assembly what contingency planning is taking place to maintain education provision should it be necessary to consider school closures? The um, issue in terms of contingency planning, we're working with officials um, to see what is appropriate because this is a fairly moving situation. I think CCEA, for instance, are developing um, their work in terms of if school exams are hit as part of that. Uh, member mentions about uh, clear guidance. I think there was an issue, I know at least with one school, on day one uh, with regard to the PHA, but actually says about a single point. It is actually vitally important that there is a single point of information, and that is actually what has happened in terms of the advice. 
We have said that in terms of the health advice, the PHA is the single point of advice, and that is where we are advising people to put it. It is not uh, my place or the department's place to give an interpretation of other people's advice, or indeed potentially what would be worse, provide contradictory advice. As regards travel, we have also made it very clear that uh, the travel advice that schools should get is directly from the Foreign and Commonwealth Office, which is a single point of advice. If we get conflicting advice on travel, if we get conflicting advice on hygiene, that would be something that would be both irresponsible and dangerous. It is also the case that while there is the direct advice of the NHL's helpline, uh, the PHA have made this very publicly clear, and indeed the Chief Medical Officer has done a number of um, contacts with schools where those have happened, and they've done a conference call with school principals so that, that single piece of advice is there, so they're able to answer directly the questions. As we move ahead, the responsible action must be to maintain a single piece of advice and a single point of advice uh, so that there is not confusion out there, so there's not contradictory positions. I call Gary Middleton. Mr Speaker, can I thank the uh, Minister for his statement on this very serious issue of coronavirus. Uh, can the Minister outline what engagement he has had with his uh, colleagues and counterparts at a national level across the UK, uh, following on, of course, from the First Minister's uh, meeting this morning with COBRA? Well, I suppose on a number of points. Uh, first of all, the executive as a whole, uh, where COBRA has operated and indeed will continue to operate, uh, will be something which involves not simply the national government but all the regional administrations. Uh, and I know that working alongside colleagues in both the executive office and the health department, uh, they have been directly involved in those uh, COBRA discussions. Uh, and specifically, I've spoken at times to both the health minister uh, and indeed the executive office, the first minister, uh, as opposed to highlight where we, we feel that there are issues that are emerging. Um, as such, I know specifically Northern Ireland has made particular contributions to the discussion around issues around school trips, whatever, but it's important that an overall central UK wide decision was taken, that again that there's consistency of, of information. It has also been that in terms of a range of the discussions, uh, there have also been at levels where there has been uh, discussions involving officials at a level directly below that, that's over, that, uh, that those have taken place on a nationwide basis with the relevant officials also taking part, and that is involved not just health officials at times, but education officials uh, as well. Some of that is also around discussion of the communication uh, side of, of things as well. I call Karen Mullen. Ken Corda. I'd like to thank the Minister for his answers thus far, and also um, your speedy response last week to my colleague, uh, Keeva Archibald. I know that there was a number of schools very anxious, I thank you for that. Minister, we will welcome you to the committee, hopefully on the 18th of March, to discuss uh, special education needs issue, issues and, of course, a response to the coronavirus. The committee has written uh, to your department seeking clarity in respect of trips and deep cleans, so I thank you for your updates today. Um, but, Minister, England, Scotland and Wales have established an education working group specifically on coronavirus uh, under the leadership of EdTech UK and ISC Digital Group. Um, it's specific to schools in order to give emerging advice and practice. DE England has also produced excellent guidance alongside a specific helpline for schools. Um, so, Minister, I'm asking that you establish a similar group here to update school leaders with emerging advice and practice and also provide advice on preparation for GCSE and A-level examinations. Thank you. Member for her comments. Uh, I'll be meeting with officials directly after this question time to uh, get update in terms of progress that we've had in terms of the, the uh, what we do. I think the issue in terms of, first of all, again, I'm keen to ensure that there are single points of contact in terms of advice. Uh, so, in terms of then um, departmental uh, plugins, particularly as regards schools, I look to see whether the best route on that is to coordinate with uh, other jurisdictions so that we can have a very consistent message or whether there's something that needs to be bespoke for Northern Ireland. But I want to ensure that whatever advice is given is accurate, up-to-date uh, as regards schools as, as much as possible. Thank you, Daniel McCrossan. Thank you, Minister, for your uh, answers to these very important questions so far. Minister, just to follow on from a point that was made earlier, 
Uh, principals have been telling me that they feel very much isolated. Uh, for want of a better description, that EA have been unhelpful. There has been no clear guidance, no policy, and they are under huge pressure to make the right decision in the interest of their children and their staff. What happens, Minister, if a principal makes a decision to go ahead with a trip and a, and a child gets contaminated? Who is liable in that case, Minister? In the circumstances of that, if they are making a decision which goes against Foreign and Commonwealth Office advice, I, you know, the advice is to take a look at where the expertise. I know there has been, over the last few years, question marks at times on whether we listen to experts, whether we don't. You know, it, it strikes me as a no-brainer to say, actually, we should be going to the best sources of information, which in terms of travel is the Foreign and Commonwealth Office, best sources of information in terms of public health, which is the PHA. I think there may well have been an issue that on day one there was some level of confusion. The advice, I think, the PHA have been given, and there has been very clear guidance given to schools, which is to say, not only are PHA the advice to follow in terms of the health side of it, but also actually then we have not simply been saying, well, go and look at the PHA. We have been giving the direct links to PHA advice, similarly with the Foreign and Commonwealth Office advice. So I have to say in terms of um, and the power with any public health agency side of things, certainly at the time being, um, is that, that advice can be given. There is no... Um, from that point of view, as with the public as a whole, they can give advice to schools, they can give advice to individuals. Whether individuals will choose to follow that advice is something which lies beyond the power of um, any public health body or indeed the Foreign and Commonwealth Office. But I would say that people would be very well advised to follow the specific advice. That means we are taking the issue seriously, but also we have got to approach this also in a measured uh, manner. And we have seen, unfortunately, in other aspects of this, not through the school system, where sometimes there has been irresponsible panic has set in. In some cases, actually, criminal behaviour has happened, particularly around uh, the issue of sanitisers. That is something which is not acceptable. Uh, but the reality is that if we keep a single message, single points of contact on the particular points, that is the critical aspect. People ultimately will have to make their own decisions. But I I would strongly urge them to follow the expert advice. I call Robbie Butler. Mr Speaker, I thank the Minister for coming in at short notice on such an important issue. Um, you spoke about the PHA being the, the port of call for that expert advice. I just want to ask you for your opinion with regard to special schools, um, severe learning disabilities and pupils with uh, uh, moderate learning disabilities, and would they perhaps be more at risk uh, in this instance? And if that is the case, would it not be your responsibility uh, to be their advocate and to be given that advice as opposed to the Department of Health? Look, we'll continue to raise issues nationally on that basis. But again, it is not my place to second guess the quality of advice that is coming from PHA. They will give specific, and indeed, if they feel that there is specific advice needed to particular schools, and it may be because there's particular circumstances have arisen in a school, or it may be because of the nature of the school, they will give that advice. We will certainly make sure that PHA are aware of the, the issue. But, you know, I'm not a clinician. Uh, nor indeed are um, any of the excellent staff in my department clinicians in that regard. We have got to follow the direct medical professional advice, and that is the most appropriate route for us to do so. I call Claire Bailey. Uh, speaker, and I thank the Minister for his update on um, the work um, that is going on with his counterparts across the UK. Could he maybe give us an update on what is being done across this island with his counterparts, just given that uh, this is our school children will be moving about this landmass in particular, um, rather than having to travel abroad? Well, I think, in terms, I think the issue in terms of movement across the border, obviously we have a seamless border. Uh, obviously we will keep in touch uh, with um, all aspects of this. Very specifically, there is a national response, which is why we are plugging into COBRA and the, the bodies that arise out of that. Uh, you know, I would say that in terms of movement, we have seen cases, obviously throughout the world, but we have seen cases throughout different parts of, uh, of the island in that regard. And I think from that point of view, um, there is nobody is at any greater or lesser risk travelling, for instance, cross-border than they are travelling within Northern Ireland or within the Republic of Ireland. If there is specific advice which uh, would act to the contrary. Obviously, we would make sure that that is brought to people's attention within that. And we're happy to work with, with any, uh, any providers of, of information. 
Uh, but look, there is no doubt of the sheer volume of, of what is both here at present and what is coming towards us. And we need to make sure that we have um, appropriate responses that are ready at each stage potentially of this. I call Jim Allister. Um, as the Minister will be aware, we're just about two months out from the key exam time in our schools for our school leavers and our GCSE pupils. If there should be any necessary disruption to that pro uh, program of exams, whose decision is it to act on that? Is it SIA's, is it the education authorities, or is it the ministers? And uh, what thought has been given to that? I know that uh, SIA have, have been working on contingency plans within that. In terms of the exact points of demarcation, I want to meet with them to see uh, where those lie in terms of if interventions are needed in terms of exams, uh, what action then can be taken. Again, we're in a fairly fluid situation, and these will be issues which, in terms of the detail, we need to drill down with the particular bodies as, as time moves on. I call Jonathan Buckley. For his uh, statement thus far, uh, and indeed the seriousness in which he has taken uh, this issue, uh, coronavirus continues to cause widespread disruption across the world. But indeed, there is a lot of concern locally from teachers, staff, and parents as to the potential impact if coronavirus does indeed spread throughout our school population. With that in mind, and given the fluidity of this situation, would the Minister outline what legislative powers are in place if it does come to a case where we have to close schools? Well, I think in terms of the legislative powers, um, there will be, I think, that uh, there's been some level of discussion, I think, particularly with the Department of Health and indeed throughout the executive um, at the overall legislative position. Uh, the UK Government, I think, is considering, and indeed was outlined by the Prime Minister, introducing emergency legislation to respond to a corona um, pandemic. That is likely to include powers for the Department of Education and also the Department of Health, which may, under the, if we reach that particular point, uh, can lead to direct schools and childcare um, providers to close. It is also the case that, uh, from a Northern Ireland perspective, in terms of the Department of Education, um, we have indicated that we want to ensure that there are the maximum amount of powers that are available. Now, as with a lot of these things, uh, I think all of us hope and pray that these are things that do not have to be um, initiated. But what I don't want to be in this situation is finding that there is something that needs to be done and there isn't a legal power to do that. It is better to have a situation uh, that you have, to use maybe an expression, all the clubs in your bag, that you can be able to use them where, where necessary than find that we are short of being able to do something. Those will only be done in very extreme circumstances. And indeed, uh, any action will be taken will be done on the basis of a coordinated response within the executive. There is also um, wearing, if you like, if you may say, a former hat from an hour ago in terms of the Department of the Economy. There will also be questions from the Department of the Economy when it comes to further and higher education um, colleges in that regard. But I think the executive as a whole will ensure that the legislation as it applies to Northern Ireland, and this may require some action, either by legislative consent or some action to be taken uh, by us. I'm sure the, I think the Health Minister will be uh, speaking soon to, to outline some of these things. We will make sure that we have all the powers to ensure that we can be able to deal with whatever emerging situation happens. Um, in many ways, we're trying to hold back a tide here. At the moment, um, as I understand it, the UK is still in a containment uh, phase. Um, but that may change from time to time, and the responses that we give, and the responses we give in individual circumstances, may have to then meet the particular circumstances of that particular moment. I call Colin Gilderney. <clears throat> I'd also like to thank the Minister for work that I know that he did in conjunction with PHA last week in relation to schools, but just to ask him that he would commit in the future where schools run into particular difficulties, that both education and public health authorities will assist boards of governors and school leaders in terms of dealing with those concerns. And there may well be specific actions. I acknowledge what, what's been said. Again, the clarity of advice and the speed of advice, I think, is critical within that. But there may also be, depending upon individual circumstances, the PHA may give specific advice to a particular school. And that might be around points of temporary closure or um, situations where, for example, in terms of contacting particular people, that there is, you know, I hope and I'm sure there will be that level of cooperation 
PHA may have to be involved in particular interventions, maybe around, for instance, deep clean of a school that, that, that may be needed. Um, again, the important thing is we also don't, uh, that what is there is measured, and we don't create undue panic for people as well to make sure that there isn't, if you like, simply a, a, an overreaction as well or an underreaction. I call Justin McNulty. Gary my yogurts, come Carla. Um, extraordinary times call for extraordinary measures. The measured advice doesn't cut it. School principals are pulling their hair out with the worry of having to make this decision about whether they should travel to Italy or not. Dragging them to the Public Health um, Authority's website or the Foreign and Commonwealth Office's website isn't sufficient. They need robust, definitive guidance on whether they should travel to Italy. And in the context of 7,375 live cases of the coronavirus in Italy and 366 deaths, surely if we're in the containment phase, it would be prudent not to send school trips to Italy and for the Minister to make robust and give robust guidance to our school leaders now. For robust guidance. That is what has been given in line with the Foreign and Commonwealth. But it is not the time. You mentioned about a measured response is not, this is not the time for that. It's a time, frankly, for calm heads and also for people not to try and grandstand on this issue or create undue panic or create problems more than, than is needed in relation to that. And consequently, we need to follow the professional health advice, which in terms of travel is the Foreign and Commonwealth Office. Now, if we're going to send out ranges of contradictory advice, and maybe the member wasn't listening earlier on, but in terms of the Foreign and Commonwealth advice, changed last night, we have made sure that before lunchtime today, all schools have been notified of that change in advice with a change in indication of the advice not to go to northern Italy and the, specifically the 16 million uh, region that has been identified um, unless it is something, indeed for anyone, unless it is something that is, is absolutely essential for them to be there. So that clear-cut advice is doing it. But I have to say, showboating or grandstanding on this issue from anyone, from anyone, from, from anyone is not helpful to this situation. We have got to do this in a calm, measured way to try to ensure that the most accurate advice is given, that the most professional advice is given, and to urge people to follow that. Paul William Irwin. Thank you, Mr. Uh, Speaker. And can I thank the Minister for a statement of the House on this serious issue? Uh, what uh, powers does a school principal have if there are concerns that there is uh, an outbreak, uh, a danger of an outbreak in their school? Well, I think, in terms of the direct powers, um, they have the opportunity to think on advice and can take, if you like, operational decisions, for example, uh, in line with whatever advice they're getting out of the PHA. Potentially, that may be for a temporary closure of the school. They have that, that opportunity. Clearly, I think school principals will want to liaise with uh, school governors, but I think that if a school principal took a view in line with PHA uh, advice that particular action needed to be taken, I can't imagine any, any set of school governors would want to stand in the way of that. So they do have that opportunity. There are, will be wider powers that will be looked at from the point of view of the Department of Education and the Department of Health uh, as the legislation moves through, uh, and that should be able to answer those particular uh, circumstances as well. I call Sinead Bradley. Mr Speaker, um, I appreciate that most patients unfortunate enough to contact or contract COVID-19 will only suffer a mild illness. But unfortunately, there are that vulnerable group of people who will be fearful of extracting something uh, much more sinister. And I would ask the Minister, given that that cohort do exist in the school environment, be it children who are more vulnerable or employees and staff there, could the Minister acknowledge that the, the PHA advice is quite generic? And I appreciate he doesn't have a clinician's voice to add to this, but they will look to him as a Minister for Education to be heard. And could I also ask, can he give an assurance that there's enough soap in schools for children and staff to wash their hands at regular basis and that they're resourced? In terms of the, that was the latter question, I've asked that uh, from the Department to contact the EA today to make sure that is the case. It has not been helpful. But unfortunately, as I said, we've seen uh, a number of people in some cases, either panic buying, in some cases, levels of theft of, of soap. We will make sure that, that there is sufficient resources to ensure that there is hygiene uh, that is there. And I think that would be a key priority. 
I, I think it is important. Uh, the PHA will need to take the individual circumstances into account where this can, can operate and give that level of advice. But again, it's not my role to particularly second guess that advice. But certainly, that, that will be something that the PHA will be cognizant of. And we may be in a moving situation um, again, sort of as, as, as the weeks develop. I call Mark Durkin. I thank the Minister uh, for his answers thus far. I appreciate, as the Minister has outlined and then underlined, uh, that the, the role to advise lies with uh, the PHA. However, uh, I suppose as a supplementary to my colleague's questionnaire, we have heard a lot from schools and principals about the difficulties they have had with resources over a number of years. Sometimes they can't afford soap. Uh, what practical assistance can the Minister's Department provide schools in, in terms of practical support and financial support? When it comes to buying things is one thing, but also if teachers are going to take time off and it's eaten into schools' budgets, bringing in substitutes too. There is a level of substitute, and we'll look, we'll look to develop in whatever level of support is needed as, as time moves on. We want to look at the, the detail of that. I, I think there's a key priority in terms of ensuring that we have hygiene uh, within schools, and I'll be liaising with officials to see if there's further action need to be taken and what assurances can be uh, directly given within that. As I said, it's not my position to, to second guess that, that health advice. Uh, as regards to the overall budget situation, uh, obviously there are very challenging uh, positions within that. I would think that clearly, for example, now, given the change in the position of the Foreign and Commonwealth uh, Office advice, and also the fact that I like to that, as I understand it, I think the decision taken over the weekend in Italy was actually to close access to a number of the ski resorts, for example. That will, in many cases, make particular uh, trips, even if there is a desire to do them, effectively null and void in the sense of the ability to even physically to be there or to be able to use that. I think under those circumstances, the levels of insurance that can be uh, provided uh, will give a very strong route for schools to be able to, to claim that. We should remember that in terms of the cost of most of these trips will be borne actually by parents, but again, there will be the opportunity to, be able to, do, to do that. People have got to, I think, follow the health advice and follow the expert advice as we move ahead. And that concludes this animal business. Members, I have received notice from the Minister of Health that he wishes to make a statement. I call on the Minister. Mr Speaker, um, can I thank you for allowing me to make this urgent oral statement and I apologise to, to members for the late notice. Of